for today's session. We'll be able to share it out with all of you afterwards. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our FAMS Comprehensive Background Check Process for Child Care Providers Regulator Technical Assistance Session. My name is Piper Novicki. I'll be both facilitating and demoing today. Uh, before I pass it over to OCFS to get us started out, I do have a couple pieces of brief housekeeping for all of you. Uh, first is that lines are muted since we do have a nice large attendance for today. So please do use the Q&A box for your questions. Some of you have found that. That's fantastic. If you don't see it, simply go to the bottom right hand side of your WebEx panel. There's a little question mark. Click that. Uh, if you don't see the question mark, there are three dots and ellipse. Click that and that'll open it. When you put your questions in there, you will only be able to see the question that you have put in unless somebody answers your question. So if your question, so if a question gets answered, then it'll be available for everybody to see. And last but not least, this presentation is being recorded and we will share it out with you after today. And now I'm going to pass it over to Jim Hart uh, from OCFS to get us started out. Uh, thanks, Piper, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking the time today to join us in this uh, technical assistance session. Uh, I'm sure everybody, it's been going on almost two, it'll be two weeks on Monday um, since we released the uh, FAM CBC. So we are sure that there are lots of questions being asked of you. Um, and we know our goal with these sessions is to provide information to help you uh, navigate the process and answer questions that may be coming your way. Um, I will say that, you know, we have information on the website. Um, then the website was down for a couple of days. We have more information going on the website. We will continue to add to the website uh, in the coming days. We'll have videos posted. Um, a comprehensive user guide is in the process of getting up there as well. So there will be additional content going on the website. Uh, we had some challenges earlier on, um, you know, getting some of that up as timely as we would have liked, but we did not want that to, you know, defer us, you know, moving forward with this. So this is a new process. You know, we know there's lots of questions that providers probably have and, and yourselves um, on the processing uh, end of things. So we want to just make everyone aware that we have resources available, more coming, and we will also continue to do these um, web-based sessions um, as needed, you know, so we'll continue these as well. Um, we want everyone to feel supported. Um, we want to get feedback. We, you know, there may be things that we need to make some modifications to based on feedback. So it's really, you know, I view this as a really important, um, you know, exchange um, with us providing updates and you providing feedback as to how things are going. So um, we're excited. We do think that, um, you know, the system processing will streamline things, make things easier, make them more manageable. You know, we've heard some anecdotal, uh, you know, comments that you know it's taking programs hours to complete the process on the screen um, and those types of things and, and we really want to work to, to address that and make sure that everyone is clear and understands how the process works because it shouldn't take hours you know um, from the provider side and from our side i think we've had close to 2000 um, cbc's already submitted since we went live um, so, you know, people are getting in there and, and you know, starting the process. Um, so with that, I don't want to continue to talk um, because we have a lot of things we want to cover. So I will stop talking, um, but we are joined by Melissa McCleary from uh, the CCFS team and Patty Burns-Zelenke from Home Office, um, from our tech team. So hopefully we can provide answers to your questions and provide some helpful information during our presentation today. So uh, once again, thanks for joining. Hope everybody has a nice um, long weekend that's coming and uh, hopefully you're able to take some uh, information away from the session today. So thank you. And Piper, I'll hand it back over to you. Wonderful.
Philippa. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, so for our agenda to today, it's going to be mostly a demo. Hopefully a bunch of you were able to view our informational session where we went through the process in PowerPoint form. Today, I'm going to go into a UAT, a testing environment and show you we're going to enter a new CBC together. I'm then going to go into CCFS2 briefly just to show you what's new. Um, what you probably all want to know is how the FAM side of all of this works. And then as Jim mentioned, we are working on several fabulous materials for providers and for you too to get everyone familiar with the system and support them. So I'm going to show you where those materials are located and point out some areas uh, that we're going to have more materials for. So Jim, Melissa, Patty, I do want today to be interactive. So if you see questions in the Q&A, um, please feel free to interrupt me and we can go down different paths as needed. All right. So. The FAMS CBC process overview. I'm just going to pause my screen real quick and we're going to go into this live today. All right, there we go. So, as I mentioned, um, I am going to go through this in a test environment today. I do not have access to the live environment. Most of the information I will be sharing with you today is from a fake account. Uh, so we are recording, which means we will be able to share this out with you afterwards. Um, and let's dive in. So the first thing we're going to do is go through this as though we are a provider filling out a, uh, the CBC, the Comprehensive Background Check for a new uh, employee, volunteer, or household member. So on the 15th, nearly two weeks ago, providers all received an invitation to go into FAMS. If they were new to FAMS, they had never created an account. They were prompted to create an account using a unique link. If they'd already had a FAMS account, they were just prompted to log in and then they could access the new uh, FAMS CBC section. So what they do is after they log in, they come to their, their programs board here. And a lot of providers are struggling with, I don't see background checks at the top. What do I do here? So what they'll want to do is they'll want to click the program below that they want to enter that background check for. A provider might have access to one program or many programs, so they'll click the program that they want to enter that new staff member for or view their staff list for. So I don't actually have access to this school right here, so we're going to pretend that I clicked this and it led me to my facility dashboard. The facility dashboard for providers will give them their child, their open child care slots, application, contact information, any grant opportunities available to them. Now, what they're going to want to do is come to the top bar here and come to background checks. They can request a waiver. OCFS is recommending that whenever possible that providers waive individuals into their facility um, if they can. So they can submit a waiver request for an individual if they have been previously CBC cleared in the last five years and have not had a break in service of more than 180 days. So to create a waiver request, they'll click the request a waiver right here. They'll then be brought to this page, which says, has this person been fingerprinted at another program or are they currently CBC approved? If the provider can answer yes to this question, they'll then be prompted to enter in the information below. Everything with a red star or asterisk is required. First name, last name, the date of birth, the previous facility name for the individual, their requested role, and the roles they see here will be dependent on the modality of the program they have selected. They'll then see the regulator's name here, who are their, their name here, excuse me, requested by will be here. They'll then enter the facility ID they want to wave this individual into and the facility name. So uh, you would just enter this information. So we'll just do one real quick. We'll say her name is Mary Smith. She has a birthday of, we'll go with today's date, but a little while ago, we'll say 2000. Uh, we'll say her previous daycare was Little Scholars. 
and the role is she would like to be an employee. Now, as you know, previous facility ID is not a required field. Um, however, it would it is, as we know, very helpful. And then they'll enter the facility ID. They'd like to wave this individual into and the name. So my fake account today is Lily Perkins Daycare. Or I think it's actually childcare. And we'll, we'll click the add facility button. Now, providers, if desired, can enter in multiple facilities. So if they'd like to see if somebody could be waived into, say, three of their sites, they could do that here. They'll click save. And then you as the regulator, um, for some reason, didn't save the date of birth. So we'll do that again. What, 2002 this year? There we go. Um, then you as the regulator will be notified. You'll get a to do, I believe, and you can go in and match up those uh those fingerprints. Um, and then what the provider does is they'll come back and they'll check. And once that individual has been waived into their facility, uh, they will be able to complete the necessary information. All right, so now we're gonna go back to our active staff list. Um, so this is that other option that you saw. So in that drop down menu, there was request a waiver under background checks, or there was the staff list. So this is the staff list. This is new for providers, and this is um, this is something that we think they're going to be very excited about. So what's nice about this is it will show all active staff for that particular program. The providers can search staff by name, role. They can also search by their clearance status. So if they'd like to see everybody that is under review or anyone that they have initiated a 6,000 packet for, they can do that. They can then apply one or many filters. They can clear those filters. Uh, they also have the ability to deselect this checkbox here, which says show active staff only. And if they do this, this will show any staff that have been deactivated, so removed from their program. And they can add a new staff member, which we'll do momentarily. Coming to the list below, this will list their active staff. So they'll have the staff name, their role, their date of birth, their status, when they were fingerprinted, the date they were fingerprinted, their clearance status, any outstanding requirements. So if somebody is a pending uh, employee and is going through the CBC process and there are requirements needed to complete that, by clicking the link here, everything in red are items that are necessary to process the CBC. And you as a regulator will be able to see this on the CCFS2 side as well. Days remaining is a nice category here. This will show uh, the providers the days remaining until that individual needs to go through that clearance process again. Now, this is another awesome highlight of this clearance letters. So you, the providers, and staff will be able to see clearance letters. These are now automatically generated. Uh, a, a provider can come in here and click the open link to view a letter. Uh, staff members, employees, household members, etc. They will receive a unique link which will allow them to create a FAMS account just for the process of viewing letters. And then I'm going to show you when we go over to CCFS2 how you can view those letters. You'll see who that letter was, they'll be able to see who that letter was addressed to, the status of that letter, um, a date associated with that, and if needed, they can also remove staff from the list. Uh, so to remove staff from a list, they'll click end date, they'll enter in the date that staff member last worked at their program, and then that will be submitted to you. Now. They will not be able to expunge this individual. Your role as a regulator has stayed the same, but they will be able to signify to you um, that they would like to remove this person from your program. All right, Jim, Melissa, and Patty, before we go adding a new staff, are there any questions regarding this staff list or requesting a waiver? There is a question in here um, about, I'm sorry, I just lost it. That happens um, to me all the time. Not really a question. It's it's more of she had gone in the uh, a daycare center had had a program or had an employee fingerprinted, 
they went in to check. They didn't see the person on there while the active staff only was checked, but um, when they unchecked it, they were there. Kate, can you actually send that to the user account box and I'll check on that? Yes. It should be. Go ahead. So what uh, Patty was talking about is this show active staff only. So if people have removed staff from their active list and they'd like to see any staff that are no longer active, if you deselect this checkbox, it would show um, all of those staff members. I do not in today's instance have any stack ma staff members that are inactive, um, but if I did, they would now show. All right, so let's go ahead and add a new staff member. Uh, so we're going to click the add new staff button right here. And we'll be brought to the staff information page. So OCFS strongly recommends that whenever possible, someone um, gets fingerprinted at another, if, if they're fingerprinted or they can be waived in, they recommend that you go through that process. If they can't be waived in, then it is a recommendation that that individual get fingerprinted first uh, for that provider. That way, after they've been fingerprinted in a couple of days, they'll appear on this list and some of that information from the fingerprinting will carry over. However, uh, we understand that um, in some instances, that's just not going to be possible. Somebody may need to be fingerprinted and you might want to get a head start on their CBC. So we're going to pretend that that is the case today. Um, and Josh did have a question about uh, an email when an employee has been end dated. I misspoke and Melissa set me right. She said you will get a to do, not a FAMS email. So just wanted to make that clear um, that when an employee is end dated, you'll get a to do, not an email. All right, so we're going to say they've not been fingerprinted. They're going today to get fingerprinted and we know they're not CBC approved because they've never worked in child care before. So we will select the no radio button here and now we're going to proceed entering in this information. So what we recommend is that the six that is that the provider has that 6000 packet from that individual who wants to work at their um, program in their hand and then they'll be able to easily move through this process so we'll give them a first name we'll say their first name is oh let's go with sarah um, and on all these pages at the top you'll see all fields marked with a star or asterisk must be satisfied to save on the page so just like at most programs that you might see on uh, that you might most forms that you might fill out anything with that star or asterisk is required uh, so we'll say her middle initial is we'll go with e and we'll say her last name is smith next question here is has this person ever been known by another name if you select yes, you'll be prompted to add in another name. And you know what? Sarah recently got married. So before she was Sarah Smith, she was Sarah. Uh, let's go with Hunter. And we'll select save. And you can enter as many names as needed here. And if a provider needs to, they can edit that name or delete that name. Next, you'll enter in that next, the provider will enter in that individual's date of birth. So we'll say they were born in April, we'll say 1998 and we'll go with April 8th. They'll then need to enter in their telephone number. And they'll need to select um, if this is their primary telephone number, providers can enter in two telephone numbers if needed. Sarah has only supplied one number, so we'll make that one primary. Mr. Digit there. Uh, and then we'll move on to our next field, which is email. We'll say she's Sarah E. Smith at yahoo.com. And again, this is just the information from the 6,000 packet. So the one thing that we're really trying to get through to providers is that the method of entering this information is different, but the information is still the same. Uh, cell phone number not required, social security number, and alien registration number not required. And last question in this top section is, does this person speak English? If they do not speak English, you, the provider selects no and chooses one of the languages here. Sarah does happen to speak English, so we'll select yes. Next, we'll enter in her address. I'll put her city as Albany and her zip code as 12206. 
You can indicate if they have a mailing address that is the same or different than their home address. So, for instance, maybe they this individual uses a PO box. You could select that here. Sarah, her mailing address is the same as her home address. So we're going to select the check box here. And last are the roles. Um, the roles that providers see here will be dependent on the modality of the program. Since this is a DCC, I believe, or, or a SAC program, um, they are assigned the role of employee. If this is a home based program, they'll be assigned the role of household member and providers can request an additional role. So I'm going to request for today's example that she is going to be um, an assistant teacher. And then the last question on this page is 6,000 packet completeness. And what they ask here is, do you, so does the provider have the required information needed to process this person's clearances? I do, we'll pretend that I'm the provider. I have this packet in my hand. I'm going to select yes. Uh, the packet was received today. And now we'll be able to save and proceed with the remaining pieces of uh, entering in information. So once you get past that, once a provider gets past this first page, they can save and come back at a later date and time. So maybe that's all this provider wanted to do right now, or maybe they've set aside a little bit of time and would indeed like to complete the entire process. We're going to go with that scenario today. Um, all the tabs along the top here directly correlate to all the different pieces of the 6,000 packet. And now what happens is the provider simply moves through these. Um, I'll note along the way some areas where they don't have to do anything. It's more of just an informational page and other areas where they do uh, need to enter information. All right, so first page is done. We'll move on to our out of state information. This page is where they're asking, um, has this individual lived or do they currently live in another US state or territory outside of New York State in the last five years? So just looking for prior residents in the New York in uh, other states or um, uh, or territories, if they lived, say, in Italy or France or Mexico or something, we that's not relevant. It's just the United States. If they indicated yes in their 6,000 packet, they'll click Yes, here the provider, and then they'll enter in as many addresses as needed. We'll say Sarah's lived at the same address for the last six years, so we'll select no, and then we'll click save, and we'll move on to our next page. Uh, you can save and move around using the buttons on the bottom here or at the top. So the blue save icon, blue save at the bottom to go back to the main pages here, and then previous and next are the yellow buttons. Next is uh, the request for New York State fingerprinting services. There is nothing to do on this page at the top here. Uh, this is simply information. If this individual has not been fingerprinted yet, this will help the provider. If that individual has any questions, goes through how to schedule an appointment and also accepted forms of identification to bring to their appointment. Uh, at the bottom of this page is role maintenance. So I know some of you had questions about end dating employees. Uh, if a provider had selected that they wanted to end date an employee on that active staff list page, they would be brought immediately to here and they would end, they would enter in an end date and click save. Um, they can also, if desired, they could also, this is another important section, if say they want to change somebody's role, uh, so maybe this person was a volunteer and now they want to be a, an assistant, for example. Um, this person's a pending employee, so I can't do that, but once they are an employee, they could change their role. And we'll move to our next tab, which is the criminal conviction statement. <coughs> Patty, I think you're um, oh, I'm sorry. muted, so I'm going to go ahead and mute you. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, all right. Um, so I saw a great question from come in from Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra asks, so there's really no need to use any paper packets now. Exactly. That's the whole point of the system is to make this much more streamlined. So the provider gets that packet. They then enter the information here and they no longer need to send that packet to their regulator via email or snail mail. Uh, so that's the, the most beautiful thing about this. All right, the criminal conviction statement here. Um, so this is another piece of information that's gonna be important for you is that the 
criminal conviction statement is now going to pull in the disclosure decision disclosure decision that the provider made. So again, this is coming directly from the 6000 packet that that individual filled out and they say, uh, I attest that the program, the provider, the question here is I attest the program has a criminal conviction statement for the individual and the staff member attested that they have not been convicted of a crime or they have been convicted of a crime. Um, if they select have not, they'll just proceed to the next page. If they select have, this window pops up and it's a confirmation that says, are you sure this person has been convicted? Because once this answer is saved, it cannot be changed. We're going to click cancel and we're going to click have not. Um, and then we're going to go to our next tab, which is the um, the request for staff exclusion checklist. So no action is needed on this page here. If desired, though, you could enter the social security number and or alien re or alien registration number if you have them. Uh, this does make it easier to complete. This does make it easier for uh, this to be completed, but those are not required. Our next page here is the SCR. So this is another really great aspect of this system uh, for the providers. So prior to the launch of this on the uh, 15th, only SACs and DCCs could submit their clearances here and pay for them, uh, submit their clearances and submit payment online. When this was rolled out, uh, this allowed all different all the modalities to be able to submit those clearances online and submit payment for them. So what happens here is, say the provider wants to say, I attest that I have reviewed the OCS terms and conditions. Hey, I can't select that. In order to uh, do, in order to do this, they have to look at the terms and conditions document. So they have to open this up, read it, they'll close it and come back, and then they will be able to proceed. After they've attested that they've reviewed the OCS terms and conditions, they can then. Um, they can then go to the, they'll then be transferred to the SCR online clearance system where they can submit that clearance and also submit payment. And we'll move to our qualifications tab here. Uh, our next tab is qualifications. And what happens here is, uh, OCFS doesn't require qualifications for everyone, so it just depends on the uh, the role that the individual is assigned. Now, it can be, of course, helpful to have this information if needed. And what the provider does is they will just move down here and enter any information. If they do start a section, though, such as education, they will need to complete the entire section. So they cannot enter, say, just the major and the credit hours. They'd have to enter all of the five fields here. Um, they can also enter in the individual's child care experience and their supervisory experience. And again, some of this information is required, say, if the individual is a director. Next tab is references. Um, again, the New York State Office of Children and Family Services requires references be provided to the office for staff with the key role of director, site supervisor, on-site provider, assistant, and substitute. So only those roles is this information required. Um, and you can upload, uh, you can add a new reference, they can add a new reference with the add new reference button, and they can also upload, and I'll show you uploading on the next step. And our last step here is the medical statement. Um, this is an attestation, and the provider attests that the program has a current medical form that supports the ability for that staff member to work in child care. They'll select the attestation box here. They'll enter in the date of that medical form. Maybe it was actually from Monday. And then if desired, they can upload. What's nice about this is that providers don't need a scanner. They can use an iPad, their mobile device, whatever they'd like to upload. So they could take a picture of that and upload it. I'm on my computer, so we'll upload a file from my computer. Super easy process. They click the upload button. 
they click add a file. They find the file they'd like to upload. Click open. And then they'll click upload here. And see how it says status change to upload. They'll click, click close and then that item will be here. And if they need to make any changes to that, they can view it with this icon or they can delete it with the trash can icon. All right, OCFS team, Jim, Melissa, Patty, uh, before we go back to the staff list and then we go to the CCFS2 side of things, was there were there any questions about these tabs or anything that anyone would like to see again? I do see some questions coming in about the SCL. Um, uh, so the, um, there's a lot of questions about the SEL. Yeah, do you want to address those right now in case the, before we move on? Sure. So by law, we cannot mandate somebody to give them give us their social security number. So, and that's even when the, with the paper packets, it was the same. So, there is an alternative through the Justice Center that you can request the SEL without the social security number. It's just not an online process. Um, as we, uh, you know, you can follow the procedures you've been following all along when you receive the to do that the SEL is ready or that to do the SEL and there's no social security number. You can follow the same procedure you've been following when you get the paper packet without the social security number. But we, as a state agency cannot mandate somebody to enter their social security number. Into that field. The other thing that I saw, Piper, that a couple people have asked for, asked about is provisional approval. Um, there is, with this release, a new CDC status called provisionally approved. It's something that you all were doing kind of in the past, at least the field was, based on the, um, the, the regulation that was addressed after 2019. And basically what that said, as long as the person is fingerprinted, and the fingerprint is in good standing and they have a medical, then they would be able to be provisionally approved, meaning they can work in childcare as long as they're supervised. So with this release, we've instituted that just formalizing that process. So if I am initiating a fingerprint and my provider logs in and says, yes, here's my medical, then they would become provisionally approved and they'll get a letter that says um, that they can work as long as they're supervised. And just thank you, Melissa. And just to clarify, um, we after we initiated um, the CBC background checks in 2019, in uh, February of 2020, we implemented a reg that said once prints were submitted they, and they had a medical, they could start working. That helped us address the immediate need for programs to onboard staff. However, it was not CCDBG compliant. CCDBG compliance says, once we get the results back of the, the fingerprints, a person can start working provisionally. We were allowing it to happen knowingly non-compliant because of the impact on programs when prints were submitted. Now the prints come right into the system. So the system knows when we get a print back um, that has no negative implications, no, cr no criminal history, and the program acknowledges the medical requirement in the system, it, the system will indicate the person's provisionally approved. So what it did was it actually took that prior process, which was, um, you know, not compliant, and we moved it into here because now we know the fingerprint results are in one place. The program can see this when the results are here. And once they uh, acknowledge the medical requirement, um, the person can be provisionally approved to work under supervision with a cleared staff. So we kind of took the prior process made it compliant with the federal requirements, which is based on the results of the fingerprint and not the submission of the fingerprint, which is what we have been doing. So we may need to make some additional uh, adjustments and, and we're looking at the reg language that's in there now, but it's kind of irrelevant because once the prints are submitted, um, and I don't think the reg language, it was written very broadly. They didn't get into the specifics of when the regs are submitted, or excuse me, when the fingerprints are submitted um, versus the results received. But this new process will reflect 
the results being received, the medical being acknowledged, and it will push the person into a provisionally approved status so that the programs will have that information. So we, we're looking at the reg and also the need to do some additional messaging around this. Um, and it's probably something we'll add to our FAQ document that we're getting up on the web too. And I know there's been questions about the letters that are going out through the system. They're not emailed to them. They're on the criminal background, right on that list. There's a section that says letters, clearance letters, and it'll say open. You can click on the open. That's the letter. It'll then mark who opened it and the date they opened it the first time that they do it <clears throat> so that we can track that it's been open. But um, the letters are the same and there's wording in there. I know that it was business practice for some regional offices to hold the CBC letter until they approve the rule and then send them all out at the same time. Now that the letter is being generated, the CBC letter is being generated straight to um, the provider and person. There was a lot of questions around that. And um, there is letter, there is wording in the letters that explain that the CBC process allows them to resume their role if the rest of their regulatory um, uh, regulatory needs have been satisfied. So it's going to be some provider education as well, probably from regulators to remind them that yes, they're CBC approved, but the role hasn't been approved. I mean, they CBC approved, they can still be on site with kids, but maybe not as director or as assistant in some of those other capacities, but they can still be there once they're CBC cleared. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much for all of that wonderful information, everyone. Um, all right. So now we're going to take a look at the CCFS2 side of things, and then I'm going to pass it over to Patty because she wanted to share some important information with all of you. All right. So now we're going to go over to my search results. So we're going to pretend that I did a search here um, and I searched for a specific facility. And I got to my Lily Perkins daycare and now I want to see the facility side of things and I'm going to show you one of those letters that Patty was just talking about. Um, so now we're going to select facility or if I want to see the FAM side of things, I could select FAMS. I'm going to select facility. And this will bring me to that CCFS2 side of things. So most importantly is that anything entered into FAMS will now display for you in CCFS2 as it's entered and saved. So you don't need to data enter it and you can review and make your CBC decisions in CCFS2 just like you did prior to the 15th of this month. So there's really just two things I'm gonna show you here because most of you I'm sure are very familiar with this view. So the first thing I wanna show you because you're all very excited to see them are those person letters. So to do that, to see those person letters, to see that read receipt, to actually review that letter if desired, you're going to go to the facility staff dropdown and you'll go to the people list and you'll go to the individual that you would like to see the letter for. We're gonna to go to Lily here because she is an approved um, individual. After clicking on their name, you're going to go to this tab titled person letters. And this will show you all of their letters. Um, you'll see an action associated with it and you can open that letter right here. So we'll go ahead and do that. This is her approval letter, the letter that Patty was talking about. Um, so this is the letter that, uh, that she, uh, let me zoom in on this a little bit so you can see it right better. So this is the same letter they received, you know, back in say February if they were approved, but now instead they'll get an email that lets the uh, the provider and the employee, household member, et cetera, will get an email with the decision and then they'll be prompted to log into FAMS um, to see that letter. Now the individual, the employee say, will have access to the same information they had before and same with the provider. So the information isn't changed changing just the method of delivery. So no more mailing and printing out letters. Um, and somebody did have a question. They said, do, uh, do I need to mail these to programs just to be just just in case they didn't get them? Well, that's what's so nice about this is that you'll be able to see 
who read that letter and when. So you'll see that that letter was opened. You'll see a status date. You'll see who it was sent to, the letter name, when it was created, um, and any category and the category associated with that. So hopefully that answers some of those questions. And the employees too will get a, their decision um, approved, etc. And then they'll get a link and they'll have a special view of FAMS that just allows them to view and print that letter if needed. So great stuff here. This is super exciting. Um, so the next one I wanted to show you was that SCR. So this is the other thing, or not the S, um, the SC. SEL. So this is the other thing that's going to be a change for all of you is that the criminal conviction statement is now going to pull in the disclosure decision the provider made when they were completing that CBC. So again, say we're on that main page, you would once again go to that people list here. You'd pick the individual that you wanted to view that information for. And then what you're going to do this time is go to the facility requirements tab and then you're going to go down here uh, to the SCRSEL tab and then it will display here in that criminal conviction statement the disclosure status so no conviction disclosed or if there was a conviction disclosed and uh, Patty and Melissa, this was all I was going to show in CCFS2 since most of this is uh, familiar to everybody on the line to date. Was there anything else you wanted me to go over? Could you, Piper, just because a couple people have asked, could you just click on that role maintenance tab right next to where you are I'd be now? happy to, Melissa, of course. Okay, here I am. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this, this is what some people have asked about it. And you'll see everyone as you look at it that there's now a new box to the right that says check when requested role review is completed. Um, F. Piper had requested a role for this person, meaning as you know, she'd logged in as a provider. She said, um, you know, Lily should also have the role of um, volunteer. Then you would have gotten that email saying a role had been requested for Lily. It would have looked at on this page, it would have been having that Piper requested it on this date and what the role was requested. You would have gotten the email and the to do. All you would need to do to clear the to do is check that box to say that you reviewed it. If you decide that Lily doesn't, you know, shouldn't get the role of volunteer for whatever reason, you don't have to um, approve that role. That's your choice, just like you would have now if they requested it. But that's the box that you would see and you would just check that box if um, when you added that role. Thank you, Piper. You're most welcome, Melissa. Anything else to show here before I pass it over to Patty? No, all right. So there is one more thing while I have control of the screen before I pass it over to Patty. Um, we did mention that there are some resources for all of you. So I wanted to just jump over there while I had my browser open here. Uh, so this is the background checks web page. You can see it at the top here. We've added a new section called training resources and information center. This is where all of those great training resources are going to live for providers and yourself as well. Uh, we have a bunch of instructional user guides. There's going to be, I think, 13 in total, and they'll walk people through how to do everything from clearing their cache and browser history all the way to a guide just for staff on how to access spams. We're also going to have a comprehensive guide, probably available tomorrow, that just combines all of these into one document. Uh, video tutorials tutorials are coming next week and a help section too. I think Patty or Melissa may have mentioned this. There is an inbox that you can message uh, for assistance right here. Um, and then there's also going to be webinars and recordings. We had a great webinar yesterday for providers that'll probably be posted by Monday. And then we also recorded the informational session for providers in both Spanish and English, and that'll be up there by tomorrow. So great stuff here. We're going to be continually adding to this as we, as the system, as we um, find out what, uh, what, what those, what more information those providers need. 
All right, and that's it for me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Patty because I believe she had some resources and some other information. But if you need me again, I will be here and I'm happy to share or show anything that's needed. Okay, so um, just to clarify, one thing Piper just said is the FAM CBC help mailbox is really for the providers. So if a provider is having issues, they can email that box. If you, as the regulator, are having problems maneuvering with the pages, please still email the user account box. That is for regulators. Please do not give the user account email box email out to providers. We've set up this um, FAM CBC help. For providers, that mailbox is for providers, but it's pertaining to the CBC pages. Um, you as regulators, when you're having issues, as always, please continue to email the user account box. So there's just a couple of things I want to. We are aware of the issue with the criminal conviction statement. Um, the developers are working on that, where the co criminal conviction statement is reading um, not received, and there's a red rule saying that won't allow you to go past it, but, um, and it's grayed out. The developers are aware of that and they are working on a fix for that. <clears throat> and as soon as it is fixed, we will let you know, but we are aware of that issue. Um, there may be an issue with references as well. If you have a previous approved reference without an address, and then you have additional references that have to be still approved, they're not, you're not able to. So you put the address in the first one and this is pre the first one's approved pre CBC pages. And then um, there's no it's grayed out in CCFS and there's no edit for that pre approved in FAMS, not for the new ones because they're entered in FAM. So that's fine. But um, so they I did just send that over to developers today, but I did want you to know that we are aware of them and we're working on that. The other thing we're aware of is um, their we used to be able to add, there used to be an add staff button in CCFS that is no longer there. Um, instead, like for your role of healthcare consultant, board member, or business contact, what we're, um, we don't have the add button in CCFS. You can only add them through FAMS, and the only options are, as most of you are aware, employee, um, follow, you know, substitute, whatever. Um, but, and those specific roles are not there. What the workaround currently is, and we are having meetings on how to best um, deal with this, um, but the workaround right now is to add the healthcare consultant and, or the board member or the business contact, add their information into the FAM CBC page. You'll only have to complete that first tab. Once you save that first tab, go into CCFS, add the correct role, so healthcare consultant or board member or business contact, add that role and immediately end date the employee role. We're asking that you do that as quickly and as immediately as you can. It is a workaround for now. It is not a long-term workaround. We will be, like I said, we're, we're having meetings on how to best address that. Um, the other thing is with <clears throat> the MyNewYork.govs, I did see a couple questions about providers getting the error message usually if it says unauthorized user the error message they have to clear their cache because a lot of providers or a lot of people in general i know i do i know a lot of other people do have multiple my new york.gov accounts if they've signed into a my say their dmv or something within the past month and then now they're going into sign into this their computers remembered that information and even so they have to go in and clear their cache and they and when you clear your cache there's an option to clear last hour last month last three months they have to clear it all time because the computer's still holding on to information even if it's from a while ago so there is guidance up on our website on how to clear your cache and your browsing history and how to do it all time and that is usually if they're getting that unauthorized user that is usually exactly what the issue is. So that's like first and foremost, there's other New York.gov stuff where you have programs with multiple programs that have <clears throat> multiple logins um, or multiple people like SAC programs where the directors are the login for each of them, but the HR director 
now wants access so that they can do the CBC stuff. Um, you can add them as a delegate that you do through facility administration. That is in helps if you, and I also sent it out on how to do that, how to add them, how to get, how to add their role. If it's somebody that um, has, wants to be in multiple programs and they have multiple IDs, the easiest workaround for that right now is to send them a new invite for each of the programs and they would set up a new mynewyork.gov with one login or pick one of the logins and then the other programs they'd have to go into each, each invite click on the link use the id that they want with the password that they want so that they can link them to the same program so that's a lot of the stuff that's coming in right now and i know some of the larger like um SAC programs in the city are their HR directors want them under one thing. So there's a lot of that coming in, but other things, if you guys are seeing it, please, like I said, regulators email the user account box. And if your providers are having issues that you are not able to assist them with, please send them to the FAM CBC help email. And I'll keep you up to date. And I talk about it at Tech Talk when I'm aware of anything that seems to be more than kind of a one-off thing. And if I can just add a couple items, um, and I just see this last question here about returning checks and having them submit online. If we have stuff that's already in process or has been initiated, we should complete the process ourselves through this, um, through FAMS. So, we can just continue to process things that have been initiated or started. And if we continue to get paper packets, this is new for programs. They may still, people are going to stick with what they know and what they're comfortable with, and they may still submit paper to us. Um, we should take it and process it and advise them of about FAMS and explain, you know, the benefits of it and promote it. This is new. It's going to take time. We're still, you know, working things out and, and kind of, building the supporting uh, guidance and resources that are needed. Um, I think we had close to 90 questions come in today. We obviously can, you know, did not have the time to answer all those, but we will take these back and work on answers to them and try to get them posted um, either to FAQ, uh, an FAQ document on the website or, um, you know, shared uh, with this group, you know, with all the regulators. Um, so we do appreciate the feedback. We know it's new. We know there's a lot of questions. Um, and you know things look different and function different than what we've been used to. But um, I think the one, if I could just leave some advice, is just to you know if, if you're getting feedback from providers, just ask them to be patient. That we are doing everything we can to support the ongoing implementation of this. Um, and this goes for yourselves as well. Um, we will do everything we can to address the questions that come in and get additional resources and guidance out there. Again, we will do additional sessions like this. Um, so, you know, we know it's going to take a couple weeks, um, you know, to really get things into a place where people are more familiar with it. Um, and we'll continue to take the questions and, and get answers out to you all. Again, thank you. I appreciate everyone taking the time to, to join us today. Piper, I don't know if you or anyone else um, has anything else to say as we close things out. That was it. Just wanted to remind everybody that a lot of great information was shared today. We did record today's session and Patty will share it out. Um, I'm guessing she'll put it on um, the help section for all of you. So if you want to refer to it later, it'll be there for you. And thank you for your great questions. We are putting together an FAQ for you as well, and we will use some of those uh, for that. And thank you, of course, to Jim, Patty and Melissa for being here today and answering all those questions. Well, have a great rest of your day, everyone. And as Jim said at the beginning, I hope you can take um, some time off this weekend to recharge and relax. And we will have more of these sessions in the future. So thanks for taking the time today to be with us.